The following segment with Izzy Posen on the subject of his experience in the Hasidic boys' school education system was recorded in July 2023. Tragically, less than two weeks later, Izzy's family was involved in a terrible car accident and Izzy's beloved mom passed away. Here are a few words from Izzy in memory of his mother, Miriam Posen Nee Blyer. My mother, Uleyo Ashulam, sadly passed away on the 30th of July, Yid Bais Av, in a tragic accident. She was young and healthy and full of the spirit of life. She had so much more to live for and to love and to give. And that is exactly who my mummy Uleyo Ashulam was always loving and always giving and always making the most of life, finding her ways of keeping up good spirits no matter what life threw at her. As you will hear in the interview, my mother Oleyo Ashulam always looked out for our well-being and gave us the best childhood imaginable at home, full of warmth and love. Just a few weeks before her tragic passing, she told me that she never forgave those teachers who brutally hit us or the head teachers who let it happen. My mum Yoleo Ashulam and I went through our challenges over the years. She found my lifestyle changes very difficult. And yet we never stopped loving each other and caring for each other. And my mother fought very hard, especially in her final months and years, for the family to be together and to accept each other. She believed in the Jewish value of being done le kaf zechis, or judging favorably, always focusing on the good in other people, rather than getting hung up on their shortcomings. Mami Oleo Ashulam leaves behind a deeply grieving family and community who will always remember her fondly and who associate her memory with a boundless love and kindness that she showered upon all of us. Zeicher Tzadiku Levrochu, her righteous memory is a blessing. We're dedicating this episode in memory of Izzy's mom. May her memory be a blessing. Here's our original recording from July 2023. Hello everyone, my name is Frida Weisel and on this channel I explore the culture, history and stories around Hasidic Jewish communities. Today I'm delighted to talk to Izzy Posen about what his Hasidic education was like. We often hear about Hasidic education in the news and recently I've been working on a series of videos where I delve into what the education system is like. In another video, I've shared with you a little bit about my Hasidic education, but in the Hasidic community, education systems vary from school to school, but they especially differ for boys and girls. That's why I invited Izzy to share what his education was like from a male perspective. Izzy Posen grew up in the Hasidic community in Stamford Hill, London, attending some of the finest yeshivas in Europe. He later went on to study physics and philosophy at the University of Bristol, graduating in 2021 with a master's degree. Since then, he's been developing scientific and mathematical resources in Yiddish, including beautiful videos, and you can find his wonderful channel linked in the video description. And he's currently writing a Yiddish math textbook. Izzy also works as a Yiddish translator and researcher, and he tutors physics and maths for high school and university students. He also takes a sociological and anthropological interest in the community, tracking innovations and lecturing about them. Which obviously makes Izzy um, very much interested in some of the same things as I am. Um, so thank you so much. I am, I've been really looking forward to this segment and seeing what you are going to share because it's going to be sort of a surprise. So thank you, Izzy, for coming on and agreeing to this. Thanks so much for having me. Before we dive in, a note. We'll be talking about various educational institutions Izzy attended, but one of the most important ones is his primary school called Tashbar. I think it's important to emphasize from the start that Tashbar doesn't represent mainstream Hasidic boys' school. It is actually quite controversial and even within the Hasidic community considered extreme. Okay, so... Um, you grew up let's let's just let's start with a very brief story you went to Haida, right in can can you describe your education sort of overall sure so firstly i grew up in london uh in the hasidic community of stamford hill 
put it a little bit in perspective, because your viewers are mostly American, there is a smaller Haredi Hasidic community in London. Difficult to put precise numbers, around 20, 30,000 people, maybe a bit more. Um, and the Hasidim are concentrated in an area called Stanford Hill. Um, I grew up and went to Haida, um in, uh, in, in Stanford Hill. I went to a Haida called Tajbar. Um, and you can see here a picture of what the Haida looks like from the outside. It's actually uh, housed in a um, old uh, um, modern Orthodox a shul, very beautiful building, uh, one of the, you know, an old uh, English uh, synagogue, um, which as the modern Orthodox community kind of died down in Stanford Hill, it became, it's now a Hasidic shul actually, it's it's the Bob of, uh, I think it's Bob of 45, you meant to say Bob of 45 shul, um, and in the back of that is uh, the Haida called Tajba, which I uh, grew up and went to. Um, it's a very rundown school, I should say. Um, uh, and I was also going to say it's an illegal school. Um, um, and it stands out from other Hasidic Chadurim, uh, uh, or primary schools, in that they don't do any secular education as a matter of ideology. So whilst um, other Hasidic Chadurim uh, will have an hour, hour and a half in the evening uh, for boys up to the age of 12, 13 of secular education, this Haida had uh, none. So what do you mean by an illegal school? What does that mean? In the UK, all schools need to be registered um, with a body called Ofsted, uh, which inspects schools to make sure they're safe, to make sure they follow a national curriculum. Also, to clarify for your American viewers, the UK is a much more homogenous country. We don't have state divisions where every state has its own laws. So the whole of the UK follows uh, very similar laws in this regard. Um, so every school has to be registered. And if you're registered, you have to follow what's called a national curriculum, um, where you have to have a minimum of, of secular education. I think in New York, that's, I think it's called substantial equivalency or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so here yeah. it's called the national curriculum. Um, and our school, in Tajba, as a matter of ideology, uh, doesn't want to follow that. And even though Satma, for example, in Stanford Hill is a registered school, it's a legal school, um, it follows, it has an hour, hour and a half at the end of the day, which it tries to show that with that it fulfills its requirements of following the national curriculum. This uh, school is kind of more extreme than Satma. And it's run by people to the right of Satma. So some of them are like Natirakata kind of people. Natirakata are an offshoot of Satma, which are even more anti-Zionist and extreme than Satma, and what particularly marks them is that they collaborate uh, with Palestinian rights groups, um, whereas Satma is anti-Zionist, but tends to keep to itself and doesn't want to work with, with kind of non-Jewish groups. So, so some of these types of people, or some people just generally on the right of Satma, or there's also some, there's also a big Litvish uh, group, a, a brisk kind of group, so I'm saying a lot of terminology that I'm going to have to explain. Um, but so the Litvisha are non Hasidic Haredim, so they don't follow, they don't historically descend from groups that are related to the Hasidic founder, the Balshemtov. They come from Lithuania. Um, most people know these groups in Israel, they're known as Yeshivish. Um, but some small section of them, known as the Briskas, Briske, um, are, tend to have lots of similarities with Satma in terms of worldview in terms of isolationism and in terms of anti-Zionism. So even though they're not Hasidic, uh, they still uh, look very much Hasidic and very much follow uh, quite extreme um, ideological isolationism. And, and these are also people who tend to, to go to this, to this particular school. Where did your family come from in terms of sending you to what seems to be a pretty extreme school? My grandfather is on the board of this school. He uh, is part of this latter kind of Litvish group that I mentioned. So can you take us through what this school was like? I don't have much good to say about the school, to be honest. And, and, and you'll see it's not because I'm just being gloomy and negative about the community. I have lots of very nice things to say about other Hasidic schools I went to. Um, so I don't want this to be taken as a, a negative brush to paint the whole community. This is about this particular school. Um, 
uh, we're talking about 200, 250 boys uh, aged 3 to 13. You know, depending by, you know, the younger kids are maybe there from 9 in the morning until 3, 4 in the afternoon. The older kids are there from 8 in the morning till 6 in the afternoon, uh, 6 in the evening. And the whole day is, well, the central mission is the same as other Hasidic schools, which is to bring up Hasidic boys, to teach them in being a servant of God, in the way Hasidim understand, and to study and get to know the classical Jewish literature, the, the, the Torah, the Torah. Um, the the Talmud, which we call Gemura, um, and Jewish law, which is called Halucha, and also some Jewish ethics, Misa, and a little bit of kind of uh, Jewish history from a religious perspective. Okay, tell us what you, wh why it was such a negative experience in comparison to other Hasidic institutions. Firstly, um, conditions were very bad, so we. We existed in very cramped, run-down um, classrooms. My class, for example, was for five years straight in the same classroom. So we went up a class. We didn't change the room. The reason for that was because we were the smallest class in terms of pupils in the school. At one point, we only had nine kids in our class. So we had to be in the smallest classroom, which was the old cloakroom of the synagogue. So it's literally just a cloakroom. And we were there for five years straight. So we would go up a class and we're still in that classroom. So imagine for a kid being there, you know, uh, eight hours a day, five, five years in a row. Um, the food was literally moldy, close to inedible, and you had to eat it. You got hit if you didn't eat it. The toilets were, I don't want to go graphic, but it was, it was really bad and, and, and unhygienic, unsafe. I wouldn't say it was a safe place for kids to grow up. And then there was corporal punishment. Um, which was practiced as an ideology in the school. Every teacher had displayed on their desk various kinds of instruments to hit children. So some would be like big wooden cooking ladles would be one, long rulers, branches, anything. And the teachers usually would have a system on how to, on which instrument is used for which kind of offense. And we, we didn't, we were just sat all day long and studied small texts. There wasn't, there wasn't much kind of in terms of character development of, or activities, you know. We very, very rarely went on a trip or, or had played. I mean, even our, the playground of the school is just a concrete, um, just a small concrete courtyard, uh, very oppressive in the middle of the buildings. Um, we weren't, the, the, the windows of the school were taped up so we couldn't look, look out or no one could look in. So it was, it was physically very oppressive and mentally so as well. How often did you get hit? I was probably hit the most in all of my class because probably I was a bit hyperactive as a kid and I like to challenge authority as well. So I tended to be a bit, you know, smart ass with my teachers. So I was hit quite a lot. I was sometimes, it depended on the teacher. Some teachers were kind of more known for, for being more um, brutal than others. You know, there would be some teachers who would, who would hit me almost daily, um, other teachers less frequently. Or you know, it's not only about the frequency; it's also about the kind of hitting. Some would be more brutal than others. I had one case where a teacher hit me so bad that I blacked out, and I had bruises mm -hmm. for a few weeks on my on my head and face. How did your parents react to that? My parents had a long-standing battle with the school about this they didn't feel it was right especially the more kind of brutal elements i don't want to go into kind of too many family details but you can understand because my grandfather is on the board of that school it was complicated i couldn't just leave the school um they didn't want our family to leave because it would reflect badly on the school so they, they put obstacles they didn't basically let my parents take me out um, eventually my parents did manage to take me and my siblings out of that school and we went to we went to much better schools at what age for me, it was kind of too late. I went, I went, uh, I just, the last six months of that school I was taking out. And you can see how desperate the situation was that even though I only had six months left, I was still taken out because it was so bad. So you were, you were bar, about bar mitzvah at the end of Chaydeh? I was just bar mitzvah. Yeah, at the end of Chaydeh, I'd just been bar mitzvah and I was taken out. For the viewers, uh, Chaydeh ends at approximately 13 bar mitzvah age and then you go on to yeshiva. Generally, that's how it works. Yeah. Let me show you, before we move on to yeshiva, let me just show you a couple of uh, pictures relating to, to uh, what I've just said. So you can just see uh, me as a young boy. I think I am 
roughly six or seven in this picture. Oh, uh, cute! Maybe. Are you are you red? Were you redhead? I guess so. Maybe more blonde. I think that might be a light effect. Maybe more blonde. Yeah, and I did get a bit darker as I as I grew in age. <laughs> but you do look re You look like a ginger. Yeah, you're right. I do. Maybe I was when I was younger. I'm not now. Oh, you're so cute. Here you can see a couple of. Um, to, okay, so in Yiddish they're called Teidas, which are kind of diplomas. W would that be a right translation of Teida? It's awards, isn't it? An award? Awards, but, but specifically a paper award. Yeah, um, a document. Yeah. That attests to your... Achievements. Achievements. So, so you can see on one of them that I finished Meseches Tumida Midas off by heart. So it's a Satma Zima camp. It, it, you went yeah. to Satma summer camp while yes. being a Tashbar? Yes. Camp is for two weeks only. Unlike in, in your part of the, in your side of the pond, we go away for, I think, two months or so. Uh, here it's two weeks. Um, so I went to Satma for that. And we learned, I think, well, we learned Namates Malukas there. There you go. For two weeks, you managed to cram in Namates Malukas? There you go. Wow. We went to summer camp, see, the entire summer camp. We did nothing. We did absolutely nothing except come up with huge mischief to get at the at the authorities. But we had zero learning curriculum. See, I yeah, I was always uh, jealous of, uh, of of you girls for having so much fun growing up. We weren't allowed that kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's common for boys to feel like they're working very hard while the girls are having a lot of fun. Yeah. So two weeks summer camp, what ages did you attend summer camp? Uh, this was when I was maybe 11, 12. Yeah. Did you feel that it was different from Taj Bar? Yeah, it was anyway different because it was summer. So it, it's a you know much easier, lighter learning program. How big yeah. is, is the summer summer camp in the UK? I don't, I don't know, maybe 500 kids, 600 kids, something like that. It, may, it probably grew since then. This is, I'm talking 15 years ago. Did you go swimming? Did we go swimming? Yeah, we did go swimming, yeah. Trips? Yeah, we went on trips, of course. It's only two weeks, so the whole two weeks is focused on, you learn the first half of the day and then you go on trips in the second half of the day. Like where? Where would you go on trips? To zoos, to hikes. Uh... Amusement parks? That's a bit too goyish. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> the girls would go on occasion to amusement parks. I think if they rent out the amusement park. Perhaps. I don't know. But when I was growing up, again, Stamford Hill is a bit behind the curve in everything. It's more conservative than the Hasidic community in America. You know, Stamford Hill still doesn't have proper restaurants, you know, because people are meant to eat at home. The whole concept of eating out doesn't yet exist. Um, it's it's a more conservative community in general. I hear you. In Williamsburg, the restaurant culture is just arriving as we speak. Right, right. It's mostly in Bar Park that it's that it's happening. So, so Stamford is probably maybe ten years behind Williamsburg. Maybe I'll come in ten years. We'll have we'll have a meal in Stamford Hill. Yeah, I'd love to take you around. Okay. Um, so what are, what are the other um, Taidas? They're, they're Tashbar. These are from my time in Tashbar. Here is from the Ruv, the chief rabbi of the Hasidic community in London. Um, I think I finished a Masechta in Talmud, a tractate in Talmud. It's from Rav Padva. Uh, he's still alive. He's very ill. Um, that was a very proud moment going to the rabbi's house and he examined us. We sat around his table. He asked us questions and then we got this to either. I see. What's, he wrote this to each and every student? No, he wrote one of them. They copied it and he undersigned them. Ah, OK. I'm, I'm still trying to process the situation in Taj Bar, which is quite alarming. Um, how were the other families about about this? To to what degree was I'm trying to make sense of it. To what degree was this okay to other parents? Uh, what about your siblings? A lot of the parents of the kids who went to this to this particular school also had 
quite miserable uh, primary school experience. Um, being children of Holocaust survivors in a new, uh, Stamford Hill was a young community then, they didn't have the developed infrastructure. So I think, you know, by today's standards, even in the Hasidic community, by today's standards, that is not acceptable. Um, but I think by the standards of the parents who sent their kids there, and as I said, it is kind of an extreme part of the community. Um, I think this is what they knew. And there's also an attitude of, you know, we are so extreme, we're so pious. The only thing that matters is that the kids study and serve God. And in fact, if they don't have, you know, if materially the situation is quite neglectful, maybe that's even a good thing because it teaches them that, you know, your material comfort isn't what matters in the life. It's about your spiritual well-being. Right. So I don't think they were too concerned about that. Uh -huh. It's very interesting because I've been charting a tremendous uh, growth in materialism and most Hasidic institutions are aiming towards more grandiose, bigger, more ostentatious. Uh, you're seeing constantly new buildings that are more extravagant. And, and I almost, except with the most extreme zealots in the community, it seems to me to be a community moving towards uh, adopting from capitalistic uh, culture around it a sense of um, luxury and I think there is an attitude of if you're in a space of luxury you can elevate the space by studying Torah in it for instance. Yeah and that, that's very much been the attitude of mainstream Hasidic groups. Satma has adopted that attitude, um, Bells has adopted that attitude. The, as I said this is this is a a Haida that caters to a different kind of demographic who who really who would reject that kind of capitalistic uh, luxury and and really do live in the way they preach um you're talking about families who do live in quite squalid conditions even in their in their in their home life and and are quite poor or make a point of you know not working but the men spending the whole day studying Torah and they mean it so yeah it's it's more it's more it's more kind of extreme section of the community. Izzy, would you say it's fair to 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 say that Tashbar is fringe? Yes. So, did you grow up in squalid conditions at home? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, to this day, my mother has apologized for sending me to that school. She uh, not just once; she feels very bad for sending me to that school. She realizes now it was very bad for me and my siblings. I grew up in a very healthy household. We live, we lived, you know, we weren't rich, but we lived, you know, we, I, I wouldn't say I, I was lacking anything growing up. Um, but I, I shouldn't have gone to that school. I shouldn't have. It was a mistake. Um, and my parents have apologized to me. And, you know, parents make mistakes. Would you say your, your life trajectory was changed? You feel like you carry trauma, in other words, because of your experience at, at Taj Bar. Yeah, I would say so. I would say it's left a it's left a, a mark on me mentally. I mean, I had physical scars um, which have since healed, but I, I I'm not sure the mental scars are fully healed. You know, I'm 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 not a you know professional in mental health, um, so I I wouldn't say with certainty that anything that happened in my life is a direct result of that experience. But I did suffer throughout my teenage years and since and still do from uh, diagnosed anxiety. And without a doubt, part of that comes from those experiences, without a doubt. I grew up with a profound sense of injustice, of being, I, I grew up feeling like I was in a prison, um, like I was being abused and I was being abused physically. And without a doubt that affected my development as a teenager. So before we move on to other, talking about your the other institutions you attended, can we talk a little more about Taj Bar? Has anything changed since in the last 15 years? Um, is this still happening today? A few years ago, I went to the BBC, the national uh, broadcaster in the UK, and I told them about what happened to me. You can see a picture on slide five. You can see a picture of me. It's a screen grab from a, vi from a, a video I did from an interview I gave for the BBC. The interview is still online on YouTube. You can see it there where I told my story. Um, there's been a bit of an outcry as a result and as a result of other former pupils sounding the alarm as well. Um, the government has tried to shut down the school. They did shut down the school. 
Lo and behold, the school popped out, uh, popped up under a different name on the same premises under the same management. Um, and it's still running to this day. I am no longer directly involved with kind of on the activism side of things with people trying to shut down the school or to reform it. But that battle is ongoing. The school is, the school is still running. I'm sure that it probably has improved to some extent. I know it still holds to its central philosophy of not teaching any secular education. I know that hasn't changed, but I would imagine, and that's why here kind of through the grapevine, but I don't know for sure, that things have changed slightly. Now, a slight change from that situation doesn't mean that everything is gold now. For The rest is up for either community members to put internal pressure on things to change, which I think is happening, and for law enforcement, um, but I'm not directly involved in those efforts anymore. Uh, you can see here also on slide six a couple more kind of uh, screen grabs from some articles in the British press uh, on various times talking about boys in illegal schools in Stanford Hill. Uh, this is an ongoing recurring issue. It makes the news cycle every few years. It comes in waves. The government tries to bring in legislation uh, to tackle it because currently there's loopholes in the law um, and the community fights it. And um, it's an ongoing saga, which is yet yet to, to kind of properly unfold and finish its course. Uh -huh. I think various issues and controversies get packed into one story. First of all, there is, I think, for me, two very big pieces to this. One of it is secular education, uh, and the other is corporal punishment, abuse, neglect in an Safe institution. Safeguarding, yeah. Safe, yeah. So for me, uh, something that always bothered me about the issue of the Hasidic boys education controversy is the tremendous focus on how much English the boys can learn and uh, how much math and science they learn, which to me personally as a parent would go very far second to a concern of children coming to school where there's an array of torture equipment on the teacher's desk. Yeah, and you're, you're right to point that out. And, and also an import, another important uh, consideration is that when it comes to safeguarding, most parents want their children to to be educated in a safe environment. I'm not going into the discussion of whether you can never hit. I know some people, you know, based on the biblical verse of right, with, um, with, with withhold the rod, spoil the child. I think it's translated into English. I'm not I'm not even going into that. I'm not saying never hit. I mean, personally, I, you know, personally, I do believe that and, and legally as well, you shouldn't hit. But most parents wouldn't want their kids to grow up in an environment where there's physical abuse rampant or where capricious teachers who are untrained can just do whatever they want without consequences. And that is changing and has changed a lot inside in the community. Um, it is, I know this for a fact, that hitting is becoming much, much rare, uh, much, much rarer than it was in my time. And I'm not that old. I was in school, what, probably 25, uh, probably 15 years ago. Um, uh, and, and it is becoming rarer. Um, the yeah the English education the the secular education issue uh, is a bit different. Although in the UK in law it tends to be connected because for the government to have powers to regulate schools, they they need to class them as a school that they can regulate. That's under their their uh -huh. purvey. Um, and once they do regulate the school, that's when they say, well, you have to follow the national curriculum. So it does end up being a, ta a fight that's tied together where, you know, some of the, the more extremist elements just want the government completely out of the education system, not monitoring it. But obviously, when the government doesn't monitor it, how do we know the children are safe? I mean, I would say most of the schools are monitored by parents, not by the government, but by parents. Parents are the ones who sound the alarm if there is abuse. With schools like Tashbar, and I think this brings me to my second point I wanted to raise, is that parents will simply raise, pull their children like your parents did, right? Parents might pull their children and say, this school is abusive. Instead of fighting with a school, I'm just putting my children in a different school. Uh, which brings me to um, the issue of, when it comes to a boys' education controversy, all schools are lumped together. There is, uh, from Tajbar to all the way to, um, I don't know, Babov. I don't know if Babov, Babov boys are fairly, 
proficient, I think, in English because they speak English at home and they have much more robust secular education curriculum. And it all gets sort of lumped into one category. As I said, it, it, the context is quite different in New York um, than in the UK. And also in New York, well, in, in, in the United States in general, you guys have a much more of a focus on religious freedom and liberty. I mean, you guys were founded to be kind of the, the religious liberty uh, um, rebels. In general, the United States is more libertarian than the UK is. Even your Democratic Party is probably more libertarian than our Conservative Party. Um, we are a more homogenous state. We have uh, laws uh, that apply to the whole country. And I think that for me, it's about law, but that's not a word, law abidingness, law abiding, law. Uh, uh -huh. about, about the principle of, of standing by the law and, and, and not. I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I believe in democracy. I believe in the rule of law. Um, and I think that, you know, you can lobby for the law to change. You can lobby, you know, for, you know, laws can change in a democracy. But I do think when there's a law, you need to abide by it. And I think when it comes to sa uh, safeguarding issues, that's why there are these uh, organizations like Ofsted in the UK, which supervise schools to make sure these issues don't exist. And once you're outside of the remit of the law, Who's going to enforce these things? How is it going to be policed? Now, I know in, the, in, in New York it's different. And I know the battles are different. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about uh, the battles there. I am sympathetic to a kind of more religious liberty, libertarian view that says the government shouldn't tell me how to bring up my kids. I'm very sympathetic to that view. Um, I, I think it needs to be done within, uh, within the law, uh, not, not try and circumvent the law. I want to ask you, I want to move on to ask you, first of all, when you left Tashbar, what was your, what was your knowledge skill? What did you know? So I was very learned in, in Judaism. That means that I had a broad knowledge of classical Jewish literature. Even as a 13 year old, I could, I can, re, I could read and write in Hebrew in, 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 that's not modern Hebrew. That's uh, traditional rabbinic Hebrew. Um, I could read Aramaic, Talmudic Aramaic. So I had at the time three languages, which is two more than uh, usual English kids uh, have. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't speak, read or write in English really. Um, I didn't know pretty much anything about my country. I wouldn't know who the prime minister is. Uh, so I was very knowledgeable in Judaism, but very uh, ignorant about anything else in the world, about science, about maths. Did you have sisters? Yeah, much younger than me. Much younger than you. I see. You're the oldest. Yeah. So you wouldn't learn through your sisters, their textbooks, what they are sort of talking about. Them. That came later. When my sisters grew old, I did learn from their textbooks. Um, and it makes me think what would have happened had these textbooks been available to me earlier, but, but they weren't. So would you say you had, um, outside of, of the textual proficiencies you had and the language proficiencies, what kind of cultural proficiencies do you think you had from possibly coping skills to uh, possibly um, uh, maybe I'm interested in a sense of masculinity that you had developed up to your, your bar mitzvah? Masculinity for a Hasidic boy means um, being a scholar or on the way to being a scholar, being dedicated to study. Um, and by study, I mean religious texts, Hebrew texts. Um, it can mean, and I want to show you a very nice thing um, that I wrote uh, as a boy. This is already in Shiva Katana, but still at the age of 13. I wrote um, in, in my notebook where I took notes of the Shia, the, the lecture in Yeshiva, I wrote a, a title page to that notebook in very flowery language. It's called Melitza. Uh -huh. Flowery Hebrew, um, uh, in Ashkenazi Hebrew, kind of a rabbinical variety of Hebrew, um, where it has a meter and a rhyme. Um, and that for me was masculinity. Um, you know, being able to use, to take our Hebrew texts, make it my own and be productive in that language and make my own uh, poetic creations. That was, as a boy, that means that, you know, I've learned something, I'm a man, um, I'm an educated, you know, scholarly man. Did you, did you have a sense of physical strength or bravado as masculinity? No, not at all. Not at all. That's, that's not Jewish uh, characteristic. I don't know. Depends, dep depends who you're talking to. Maybe in Israel they uh, have different... 
traditionally Jewish. Uh, it's not a characteristic that men aim for. And in fact, um, you know, the non-Jews used to make fun of Jews and stereotype them as kind of feminine, effeminate and weak. Yeah, a friend of mine just read a, a whole book by uh, the scholar Daniel Bayarin, uh, who's a scholar of Talmud, and he has a whole book about uh, the... <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with the whole premise, but I think he calls it the, the Jewish man as a sissy, uh, how he sees it. Aha. Uh -huh. It's interesting you use the word flowery language because there is uh, flowery is probably not what we associate with um, masculinity, right? It's very baroque might be a different word for it. Very ostentatious in, in language. Um, it's difficult to explain. Uh, Can you translate what, it? Uh, I can try. Um, I haven't prepared for this. I'm <laughs> uh, You can do it on the fly. You're. You got this. In this book, um, with God's help, help, it would be written uh, lectures of Torah uh, that are said uh, through the lecturer, the wonderful lecturer Haraf Agua Nerbusha Zevbeigeshlita, one of my teachers. Uh, day by day, week by week, year by year, and it is um, uh, it is God's providence that I uh, well, that I merited to learn under Him and to be pleasured from the glory of Torah and from the sweetness of His tongue and from His clear direction and from His straight mentorship and from His good advice. Um, uh, you, you get the picture. I see, the kind I see. Of, uh, yeah. we, we have, among girls, we also have a, a, a kind of a floweriness that is, um, on, on its face, if an outsider reads it, they think there is some kind of outpouring of, of, of excessive affection, but it's just you bring in as many adjectives as possible to accentuate and adorn your, your message just for the, for the thrill of it, yeah, for the poetry of it. Yeah, in general, Hasidic culture is not a subtle culture. It's a very expressive, in-your-face culture. When you, you know, it's it's not it's it's not uncommon for men to tell each other, "Oh, I love you, brother," you know, and you're very ex expressive with your feelings or, or with your emotions. When you're excited to see someone, you're going to make it very, very clear. And when you don't like someone, you're also going to make it very clear. There's no subtlety, if. If, if you know what I mean. I hear you because I probably would disagree with that in terms of the women's side of the aisle. Women are often much more restrained, but mm. also oftentimes it seems men will go up to another man and say, what happened? You put on weight? What were you eating? And, and women will never say it to each other, but then maybe... That's how, yeah, I, I bumped, it's so funny you mentioned that example because I recently bumped into that friend I haven't seen in, in 10 years. The first thing he said to me is, Izzy, you've gotten fat and, he, and hitting me in the belly. You know, it's, it's a, this boundaries are a bit different. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know what? I yeah. actually find physical boundaries among same sex in the Hasidic community seem to me to be, to be much more liberal people are much more comfortable being in each other's space. I find that when I go to a chasana, I go to a wedding at this point in my life, I am constantly backing up from people as they talk to me. They talk to me, they're telling me something. I'm like, you're so, I'm used to having developed so much more physical space than, than people seem to give each other there. Yeah, look, it, it's a very, it's the, you know, it's, an, it's the opposite of an individualistic society. The society is a community. Um, you're always surrounded with people. You grow up, it's more cramped, physically more cramped. You go into a, a Hasidic shul compared to going into a church, you know, uh, there's, there's, it's much more dense. Um, it's a different concept of space, different concept of personal space, um, and definitely a more comfort amongst men to be physically intimate with each other, so to speak. Um, and has nothing to do with anything to, you know, nothing to do with homosexuality and anything like that. Many are just more comfortable in each other's space. I wonder if we should move on to Yeshiva Katana because I still have quite a lot to go through. Let's go. Um, Let's do it. So after uh, the age of 13, a boy goes to Yeshiva um, um, where he's now dedicating his life fully to religious study, mainly the Talmud, mainly, mainly Gemurah. I went to um, Satma Yeshiva Katana, it's called, in London. Um, 
And I actually, in, in stark contrast to my Haida years, I actually had a very good time there and I, and I really liked it. Um, it was, you know, in terms of all the issues I mentioned, hygiene was, was, was good and the food was good and it was comfortable. Um, on the other hand, the learning was even more intense, which I loved. Um, so we spent all day long, and this is literally all day long, we'd come often from seven in the morning, as early as seven in the morning, staying until uh, 9.30 or so in the evening. Um, and we just sit and study Talmud, uh, uh, that's Halacha, and, and, and so on. It's there in Yeshiva is where I discovered the kind of anal analytical approach to Jewish study. It's, you're no longer just studying by root, memorizing. Um, you are actually trying to understand, you are analyzing, you're breaking down texts, then you're seeing what medieval commentators have to say about it and the commentators on the commentators, um, and, and it's very enriching and, uh, and you know, you can, you, can, you can really go down the rabbit hole with multiple levels of generations who are commenting on each other. So, on page seven here, um, you can, so here you can see the guy on the left-hand side is called uh, Reb Wolf Blum of blessed memory, he's no longer alive. He was the Rosh Hashiva. I had a very lovely relationship with him. He really liked me. He really mentored me, tried to help me in my problems of anxiety that were developing at the time. He sadly died young a few years ago. Um, you can see why I chose this picture is because that's when the Satmar Rebbe came to visit our yeshiva. It was a very momentous occasion. Um, we were all very excited. Um, and, and I and I still remember it, uh, even though it happened quite a while ago. Can Can you clarify which one is Bloom, it, with a mic? The guy with the mic. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here further, I have some notes just to show you an idea. This is my Hebrew writing. Um, uh, this is me kind of starting to take notes in Hebrew. Boys are expected in yeshiva to take their notes in Hebrew. Again, it's not modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew speakers will not be able to understand a word of this. Uh, this is a dialect. Um, it's called, in the literature amongst academics, it's called Ashkenazi Hebrew. Um, it developed slowly from Mishnaic Hebrew, then Medieval Hebrew, and then later Early Modern Hebrew, um, which borrows heavily in its vocabulary from Aramaic, from Talmudic Aramaic. And its grammar structure is quite simplified to match, almost to match Yiddish in certain respects. So it's kind of this hybrid of Hebrew, Yiddish, and Aramaic. Um, and we would take notes in this, and I took a lot of notes. Were most of the students able to write notes like this? I think I was amongst the better students in this regard. Um, not everyone was able to. Those who couldn't were a bit embarrassed. You know, you were kind of expected to, um, and people would show off if they had a good good Hebrew. Uh -huh. uh, um, this is beautiful. I, I was... Thanks. Um, on the right, you can see uh, I think one of them is uh, a, a, a notes from a Talmud lecture, and one of them is Aleph. Is that from, is that what it says? That's Halucha, Sif Aleph. Yeah, Sif that's, Aleph. Uh, uh -huh. That's Halucha Shabbos, actually. See, I I can't understand it. Shid Halucha Aleph Mem Tes Vuv Mem Tes Samach Tes. Matas Masai, that's Matas Masai. Oh, the Sedra, the Parsha. Yeah. I see. So this is the date. So what yeah, you're studying the with a date and who your lecturer is. Yeah. We've taken apart one sentence, Izzy. <laughs> I feel like we cracked this. Um, I have a question. Did you ever have homework during any of your years of Chaydid or, or Yeshiva? No. No. You no. never came home with do this... Or, or prepare for this exam? Mm, not really. We had fa we had to do a certain amount of chazura, um, which is review. It wasn't anything, yeah, revision over Shabbos, for example, and we had to have our parents sign it, sign that we did it. But there weren't specific tasks that we needed to do. Keep in mind the days are so long. You know, when would we do it? We're, we're literally all day long in in yeshiva. What was the schedule like in yeshiva? In yeshiva, you'd start off with an hour of self-study before uh, the morning prayer shacharis then you'd daven shacharis then you'd have shir ian it's called which is um 
analytical study so where you're really going slow you're taking the text you're taking it apart then in the afternoon we'd have shape push it which is more kind of study for the sake of breadth so where you you're not analyzing so much but you're learning to understand a kind of many pages of talmud and then we'd have ha halucha jewish law and we'd also have some misa or hasidus so basically ethics in across all hasidic uh, yeshivas or most there is no secular subjects past age 13 correct yeah yeah uh, yeah no yeah Okay, so um, let, uh, let's see what else you can tell us about your yeshiva experience. Would you, did you find this uh, sufficiently intellectually gratifying that you didn't feel like you needed more, you needed to learn more? I was fully absorbed in it. I found it very intellectually stimulating, and it was. Um, I had excellent teachers there who I developed really close uh, intellectual bonds with. Um, some of them I keep close with to this day. I, I was always curious, you know, I did kind of try and look beyond the horizons and read books we were told that, you know, are not really meant for you and read pages in Talmud that we were told to skip, that kind of thing. Um, but overall, I'd say I was, I was intellectually satisfied. Is there a, a social hierarchy you can climb in terms of your intellectual development in Gemuda and in, in Talmud study? Yes. You, if you firstly, if you study longer, you're, call, you're called a masmid. If you spend a lot of time studying, so you know, a listener might hear this and think it's a lot, all this studying. But even during break times, the good boys, the masmidim, would be expected to study. So during lunch break, we had an hour lunch break. I would grab lunch. Literally, I had a schedule, a very tight schedule. I would grab lunch for ten, fifteen minutes, eat, and then come back to to Basmedrish it's called to the study hall to study more even during break time even whilst eating I sat with a group of boys the Gitta Bucherim they were called the good boys and we would talk about what we studied on the way home from 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 yeshiva I was part of a group of boys we lived in the same area we would walk to and back from yeshiva together we'd talk about what we studied during the day so our mind was very single-mindedly into the studying and that's we were brought up that that's how it should be I can't say it's healthy. I can't say it was healthy with reflection. That was actually probably quite damaging to my development. Um, and it was part of a suite of issues I developed. Um, anxiety, perfectionism, you know, where you never feel you're doing enough. Constant guilt, no matter how much you're doing. Uh, but that's how I lived as a young teenager. Wow. Did you? Did it come along with, with from Kaiten, with, with actual application of, of stringencies in religious observance? Yeah, these boys were called Chanyokn. Uh, so Chanyok is somebody who, who goes above and beyond, especially, especially, how do you define Chanyok? Especially with kind of p like insular piety or inwards looking uh, uh, introspective piety, um, which is also marked with external behavior. So you might be washing your hands longer than other. It, it's probably not completely unrelated to OCD, I should say. Uh, it's This is highly, you know, this kind of lifestyle is highly susceptible to all kinds of mental conditions, which you can brush away by saying you're just being pious. But yeah, it, it, so you're, you're praying longer, you're praying with more kavuna or intention. Um, when you're walking on the street, you're looking down like this, not to see any women. You know, one of the interesting things with the Chesich population is that a lot of the things that could be a source of developing various issues like the children being hit and like being taught repeatedly to repress uh, natural uh, sexual desire are not uh, applicable to women. We were never taught anything about anything like that. There was no conversation about sex whatsoever. So whatever was going on in your head, no one taught you to, to repress. And of course, girls being girls, there's gossip going on. There's like, uh, you know, uh, the, the joy of, of finding out the forbidden without that level of guilt that boys are subjected to. And of course, we were never, ever, ever hit. The idea of a teacher picking up a hand is inconceivable. So I think it would be interesting. I don't think that women in the city community are exempt from the various um, struggles that is to be human, all the, all the anxieties and, and um, various mental health issues that, that manifest everywhere. I think it would be an interesting study to compare 
uh, between men and women? It certainly would be. I, I think that given how gender segregated the Hasidic community is, I think that men and women almost form two parallel societies in a certain sense, um, making overall generalizations invalid. I like to say that when it comes to men and women in the Hasidic community, for before marriage, boys get the harder end of the stick by far. After marriage, women get the harder end of the stick. That's kind of how I conceptualize it. I think before marriage, girls are allowed to more or less have a good time. You put on shows, you go on trips, you have fun. Um, at least that's how it appeared to me. And whereas for boys, it's very harsh. But after marriage, it's the opposite. Men get a bit more freedom and authority. And it is a patriarchal community. So men, men do have the final say. Whereas women are suddenly encumbered with one child after another um, and, and lose all that freedom and are under the authority of, of, of the man as well. Uh, does that ring true to you, that characterization? I've I've heard of it. I've heard of it. I think uh, I think it it really depends on how comfortable you are in your gender role in the assigned sort of category. A woman who uh, takes naturally to her place as a mother and running a household. And there are women that I find adapt really well to this all female environment where they rise to positions of power or they or they're just very comfortable in in their role as as a uh, woman and head of household of the, the female sort of second head in the home. I find that that is a, a great way for them to live while you can have all the freedom to make plays and you can have all the free time. If, if you find the female only world to for in some way not be satisfying to have to build expectations there's a special there's a specific culture around women and if you find yourself out of place there i think it could be really really difficult one way or another i think also to to your point about being a kanui and, and being you were a very very serious boy i think i think it also depends how a child adapts to a particular childhood like there there might be boys that daydream through yeshiva that, that that don't don't particularly absorb as much as you absorbed you clearly absorbed an enormous amount from you so they might have a different way of of relating to their childhood does that make sense for sure for sure uh you know, generalizations are by definition, uh, you know, generalizations, they, they fall short. And there's a lot of individual nuances and everyone's experiences is, is, is different. I do think even as much as I kind of did envy the girls in a certain way growing up, I, I also realize that actually I have access to the, the, the treasured uh, heritage of my culture and they don't. And that's, that for a girl must be, and I've, I've heard other women say this as well, that, you know, you didn't even, I had to follow all these rules, but I didn't even, wasn't even allowed to know where they come from. And I was never allowed to have, especially a Satma girl, which is never meant to study anything in the text itself. Uh, that can be very exclusionary. And spe an intellectual girl who feels, you know, she's following all these religious rules, but she wants a connection with it and, and she just can't get the, that intimate connection. Whereas for me, I feel a tremendous privilege, even late in my life, when I questioned things and when I rejected certain things, I could do it in a very informed way. I could go to the sources, I can study them, I can make up my own mind with them. They were mine to do with them as, as, as I wished, which I think women don't have. Yeah, yeah, I very much relate to that. I very much relate to that. Uh, I, I want to I talk about Talmud study. Do you still study Talmud? Not as much as I should. Uh, um, I I uh, I think t I, t I think the Talmud is um, t t tremendous human treasure. Um, it's a document um, of historical significance. Um, it's part of what forms our very proud heritage as Jews. It's something I definitely want to pass on to my children, boys and girls. Um, it's and it's something that when you take it from a historical perspective rather than a, from a fundamental fundamentalist religious perspective you can find in it tremendous human wisdom alongside bits that you can reject or evaluate or or, or, or say that that was part of of their time so what I, you know when i was going through my questioning phase and i was taught that every word in the talmud you have to take literally and it was supernatural everything and um 
um, and everything they say is absolutely true and they knew better than everyone and they knew all the science and everything, I then found it very lacking because obviously it's not that. It was built up to be something it can't be. And obviously they didn't know what modern scientists know and there are mistakes there and there are things that with modern eyes sound a bit absurd. But now that I rephrase it in a human perspective that was written by humans from a different period, I find in it a lot of wisdom and a lot of proud heritage. It, it, it ties me to my roots of where, I, of where we are as a people, where we came from, our intellectual development as a people. Are we done explaining your, your education? Can we talk about what happened afterwards? I want to share about my Yeshiva Gadoyla years in okay. Gateshead. Um, ah, you went to Gateshead. When I was 18, I went to Yeshiva Gadoyla in Gateshead. It's not a Hasidish Yeshiva, it's a Haredi Yeshiva. It's the, most, uh, it's the biggest and most prestigious Yeshiva in Europe. Uh, you can see a picture of it here. There I learned under the Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Avram Gurvitz. And you can see there a picture of him giving his Shi his lecture. It's difficult to describe the amount of respect and awe I and we boys had for that man. He's still alive. You are in an environment where there's 400 boys sitting together in a big study hall. You can see a picture of that study hall. And the only concern of theirs is to understand and break down the text. It's not like a silent study in a university library. It's a study where you're constantly hoarse because you're constantly shouting at the top of your lungs because everyone is shouting together. You're studying with your whole body. You're swaying. You're, you're waving your hands. Um, you're getting into it. And you're studying for hours and hours and hours without break. So you can sit for four or five hours without lifting your head. It's like being on drugs. You get into a spiritual state, um, which is difficult to describe or replicate. Um, it's a kind of transcendence. And you come out of such a study session and you just feel pure spirituality. Um, and I'm saying this as somebody who is now a skeptic, an unbeliever, um, but there's something that taps into to human psychology in that way of being. And coupled with the belief that this is, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're connecting with God's pure word. And then after these, these hours of study, you go into a lecture by the Rosh Hashiva, the white bearded kind of saintly man. Even just looking at him, you can tell he's a saintly man. And he really is. He's the kind of person who is, he lives in his own world. You feel the aura. You come next to him, you feel kind of his pure intellectual aura. You go into a lecture of his, and we believe that every syllable that came out of his mouth was God's word. And and you, and, and, and we, I took detailed notes. You can see a picture of, of the notes um, that I took. Uh, you can see my handwriting has, has matured a bit. This is when I'm... This is when I'm 18, 19, um, and I take down every word that he, that he, I was quite a fast writer, take down every word. And we'd also record it, and then we'd listen over the recordings, and then we'd spend hours unpacking what he meant with every sentence. Um, and it just, it was spiritual bliss. It was spiritual bliss. Why were you mm. screaming? Is it a call and response? You get, first you're studying in partners, so you have to communicate with your partner, and because this 400 boys in a small, in a relatively small area, there's just the, the decibel level is very high. So you have to scream, but also because you're really getting into it and you're passionate and there's no compromising. You're not nice with your partner when you think your partner is wrong. You shout at your partner. If your partner has an interpretation which you, which you think is wrong, you're going to shout at him and you're going to tell him, no, you're talking nonsense and you're going to fight it out. There's no, co there's no let's agree to disagree. You can stand, you can go into yeshiva and, and notice in the corner two boys standing there shouting at each other for an hour. And they love each other. They're not. They don't. They're not enemies. They're the best of friends. And by the end of it, they're gonna. They, they're gonna be best of friends. But right now, all that matters is the truth. So they're gonna shout at each other until they hammer it out. And that's a rigor. That that's a rigor that I that I really connected with. And I, I have to say, later when I went to university, I kind of missed that that rigor. I should say it's rigor in a narrow sense because the foundations of the study. We don't have time to go into it. But the foundations of the study are. Um, are very not rigorous. So the assumptions you make for why everything has to make sense in the text is very flawed. So you're assuming that the text is the word of God, therefore everything has to make sense and everything has infinite depth. In reality, it's words written over many generations by different people. There's many scribal errors. There's many things that, that crept in over the, over the years. So, you know, if there's contradictions, maybe they're meant to be there rather than meant to be flattened out. But putting that aside, 
you have a tremendous rigor in the sense that you're going to, you know, based on the assumptions you make, when you build on that assumptions, you have a tremendous rigor in battling it out to the to the end. Interesting. Would you say, I suppose it's a kind of, it's a kind of a high. I can totally see how for the very bright students, that would be a tremendous way to, to be able to express their, their think, to challenge themselves and, and to express their challenges with someone else. These students at Gateshead were handpicked. Yeah, we're talking about an elite group of, a group of students. It's, it's, it's in a very elite place. How do you get in? We had to go through several rounds of exams um, uh, to get in and, and only a, hundreds of boys apply and only a handful get in. And I remember I was uh, the day I got uh, accepted, it was it was a very special day. It's a bit to describe it to kind of secular people. It's like getting into Oxbridge or the Harvards or, or the Yale, that kind of thing. It's uh, an elite place. How did your parents feel about you going to Gateshead? They were very happy. My father went to that yeshiva. My grandfather went to that yeshiva. So it's been in the family for a while. Um, they all had uh, very uplifting and, uh, uh, you know, experiences of growth there. Um, so I went there uh, as well. Was was going to such a prestigious yeshiva and being such a wonderful masmid uh, something that you understood had bearings on your match prospect? And were you thinking about that? Yeah, it's always as you turn 16, 17, 18, it's always at the back of your mind. You you know, you constantly feel the, the eyes of people on your back wherever you go um, uh, so you're always aware of that and later when I had struggles in yeshiva when um, I had struggles with anxiety and later then with faith as well and I and I was no longer that stellar masmid um, I was really aware and there was a lot of pressure on me that I'm ruining my my matchmaking my shidduch prospects in what way would having ruined your match prospects manifest in terms of your potential mate what what, what did you actually think the girl that you would be matched up with would be different now that your stature has fallen? To be honest, I, I can't say I've spent a great deal of thought on on that. I, By the time I was, you know, the, the matchmaking process was unfolding, I was already with one foot on, on the outside um, thinking about other things. I actually, I actually asked for the process to stop um, because I wanted to figure out what, what I wanted to do with my life. Um, but it means prestigious match can mean a family with pedigree, so a family that can has yichas, that can trace back to big rabbis, can mean a family with money that will be able to support you. So if you are a Torah scholar, a young boy who wants to sit and study, you don't want to have to worry about earning a living. If you get married off to the daughter of a rich man, the rich man will support you and you can just spend your time studying. Um, lots of my friends did that. Did you, uh, um, the question I'm asking in particular, maybe this is something that you can try to uh, think of in hindsight. I know you didn't have a concrete sense of, of loss of status, but I'm just wondering, do you, is, is the thought, oh, now that I'm not a Masmud, the girl is going to be maybe more liberal or is that she's going to be perhaps with a physical flaw or a, 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 a issues? Like, in what way does your marriage prospects change I think given the family I was from, my conception was that if I don't get good match prospects, it's not that I'm going to get a more modern girl because my family isn't modern. So that wouldn't be the match arranged for me. It was. It would rather be that I'd get a girl with problems, with personal problems or issues. I, because I, I imagine if that's what's going through your mind, it motivate, it makes the process of of moving away from your stature as a masmid so much more painful and potentially the loss so much more it was a very painful period in my life um and we don't have time to go on it fully and i think we've covered a bit of it in, in the previous uh, discussion we did um but i firstly uh, you know it was it was the time when when all my issues were coming to a head and where i couldn't just bury myself and in, in study anymore S -s severe anxiety was was um was manifesting itself and, and severe doubts and no longer sure that this is the life I wanted to live. Um, I had, yeah, matchmaking, it was constant pressure back uh, at the back of my mind, but I had bigger pressures and pains to deal with anyway. I mean, it was all part of the package, but that's when there was a certain point where I kind of completely dropped out of the study system in yeshiva and and would just spend my day my days 
studying uh, secular books I found in the library or thinking about my next steps. How old were you then? This is when I was 19, 20. Uh -huh. What happened to all the people that knew you at the study hall, your, your partners, study partners? Most are now married with uh, four or five kids. Mm. Um, hopefully happy, it's... hopefully happy. Some are still studying, some are working. Um, we, all, we all choose our different paths. Of course. Did they, uh, my question was more, did they watch you go through what you were going through and try to, in some way, step in? I had a mentor in yeshiva uh, called a mashkiach. Um, who, who was very, very helpful and very compassionate with me and would talk a lot and he tried to help me. Um, it was something beyond, it was beyond what my friends could help me with. At that point I needed therapy, probably needed medication for anxiety. It was, it was, it was quite a severe case. Um, my friends of course tried to help me, but it also came to a point where I started exploring, uh, uh shall we say more heretical kind of points of view. Uh, which my friends found unpalatable and there was a certain point towards the very end before I left yeshiva when um, my friends were kind of bullied not to talk with me anymore because I was considered kind of dangerous ideologically um, you know I was considered a corrupting influence when did you leave yeshiva I left yeshiva in the summer of 2015 summer of 20 2015 um, I was 20 years old um, and I left and left, I left the Orthodox community then as well. And I started secular education. I went to college and eventually to university as well. How is your English so fantastic? <laughs> I know the answer, think, but I'm asking for the, for the viewers. I don't know. I think I have, you know, some people are good at some things. I think I'm quite good with languages. Yeah. By the way, here you can see a picture of me on my final day in yeshiva taken in the library of the gates of yeshiva you can see the background of books a friend took it with a hidden smartphone we weren't allowed to have smartphones there a friend took it with a hidden smartphone um and that's me ah oh, sweet uh, what is the begidrai tajbu kaayin to uh, i'm embarrassing myself i'm gonna stop so that was i want to illustrate with that so that's something i wrote in my free time during bainas manim that means between terms um, where you're still expected to learn, even though you're kind of on break. And during uh, Bainas Manim, you're usually studying, rather than the usual stuff you're studying in Yeshiva, you're studying something related to the festivals. So uh, Passover, Sikhs, and so on. This was Sikhs time, Sukkot. And I studied the Sigya, or the subject, of the how you're meant to live in the Sukkah. Um, and I came up with a novel interpretation um, which I was very proud of. I studied it quite thoroughly with the Rishonim and Achronim, the so the different levels of commentators, and I came up with a novel interpretation. Um, and that was, I think it was, we had just bought a laptop in our home, so I also used that to type up uh, my Chiddush, uh -huh. uh, my, nove my novel uh, idea. Uh, so that, that that's just the... That I have there. I, I can sense the joy that you're getting as as you churn out this tremendous innovation. It's a, yeah, it's a it's a good it's a milestone when you kind of you're no longer just passively learning. You're starting to come up with your own thoughts and ideas, and you can make your own mark on this culture of of learning. But even as a boy, just at the at our family Shabbos table, and I think this is standard for any home, the boys model that to some degree every shop is by by saying uh, a device by 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 um saying a toida by by meaning they do a little portion of the weekly reading of the torah and they come up with a novel interpretation and and like you said it's built on certain assumptions you're not allowed to challenge they are fixed but on top of that whatever's on top of that you're supposed to do kind of rhetorical um bringing together from various sources and, and tying it up with a satisfying bow that the boys are practicing from a pretty young age, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Although, you know, there's, there's various kinds of, there's, there's drush, there's pshat, there's, um, there's, um, and I was quite, I was quite a rationalist in, in, even to my, in my approach to Talmud, I, I really disparaged the kind of drush where you're just saying nice things and it 
comes together. Uh-huh. Um, we used to call it Ingerish Toyers, Hungarian. I see. <laughs> I was more into the brisker stuff. I see, I it. see. Uh-huh, you're a snob. Okay, I have the last question. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 we're on a time constraint, so I'm, I, this is my last question to you, Izzy. How has your perception of your formative years and the education you received during your formative years changed over the years since you're leaving yeshiva at 20 to this day? I think I am both, in one sense, appreciative of the education that I had for connecting me to a rich and vibrant heritage of learning. And I think the Jewish heritage of learning is quite astounding how over thousands of years, under very oppressive conditions, Jews kind of buried their heads uh, in the books, uh, distracting them from all the issues, from persecution, from hunger from poverty um and and that's even from a secular perspective that's a i'm, I'm I, feel, I feel privileged to have access to that body of heritage um on the other hand as we've discussed there's lots of issues of my formative educational years that were quite problematic and quite damaging in the long term um and obviously you know i had to work extra hard over many years to catch up on secular education and and um, and learn about the other aspects of our wonderful universe. For me, there's no for me there's no distinction between Torah and and knowledge of the world. For me, it's all about uh, getting to know the human condition, getting to know how the world works. Um, and for me, it's as important to know the laws of physics than it is to know. Uh, um, um, a tractate in, in, in Talmud, perhaps more so the former, because it's more universal. Um, but as a Jew, th- that's for me. That's for me Jewish knowledge. It doesn't stop with Talmud. It, it it's knowing the world as a whole, and, and that's what I would I would like to. You know, I don't have children yet, but one day when I come to pass on to my children, the culture of learning, I'd like them both to be able to appreciate our heritage, but also to to know the world wider and be citizens of the world. Thank you so much for everything you shared. It was it was really really interesting. I very much enjoyed talking. I always enjoy talking to you, Izzy. Can we can we share tell the viewers where they can find your work, where they can read more about you and what you do? They can follow me on Twitter. Um, I am building a website, but it's not up yet, uh, so I'm not going to share that. Actually, let me. I'll share IzzyPosen.com. It's going to be up. In the next few weeks. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, but everything you do, you you link on Twitter. You're you're pretty active. I try to. You yeah. try to. You try to. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me, Frida. It was a real pleasure. And and thanks for what you do in general. It's important work. It's 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 singular work. It's work that others are not doing, so which makes it even more important. Um, I'm yeah. I've watched what you do very closely, and I'm excited to see what you do next because I'm sure you you've got lots of great things up your sleeve. Well, I'm doing this. I'm I'm doing this. But yes, Thanks. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's divrachizik. I appreciate it. <laughs>